give you an overview of the project, and then just so I don't forget to mention this, um, we actually did two, two reports from this project. It's actually three. One's the giant fat report that my graduate students uh, wrote that's for diehards. It's over 100 pages. That scared a few people away. Then, uh, at the request of the community, we also did sort of a, a community guide, which has steps and actions that you can take uh, to protect the resources here. And it's only, I think it's like a, it's only 12 pages, so it's easy to digest. And then we have a policy guide for the, the decision makers in the county. So we've tried this time to target the different audiences. If you're interested in a copy of this, I brought one. And then the Rockfish Valley Foundation has a stack of them. Master Naturalist has a stack of them. And the county has a stack. And there's also some of the visitor centers. So they're around in the community. And it's also available for free download. That's the end of the infomercial. I just often forget to mention that there's a report. So let me I'll just begin with that. Uh, so as Nathan said, I'm with the Green Infrastructure Center. We're a nonprofit. Uh, and we formed this nonprofit so that we would be able to get other people's money to test out these ideas, demonstrate how they work, and then release them into the wild. So the idea is not to make a lot of money at this work, just to be sustainable, but really to try to test out new ideas. And so we've been going around Virginia doing a series of field tests on how to map natural and cultural resources. And we work a lot with a firm called Skio Solutions. Uh, they give us all of their designers and graphic artists at cost, meaning no profit is involved just because they're good doobies. Uh, so today I'm going to talk quickly about green infrastructure principles. What does that mean? I'm going to give the case example from Nelson County. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you uh, sell these ideas to your own decision makers uh, back where you live. Okay. So we've done field tests across Virginia. Those orange dots uh, show you some of the locations. Uh, I also do teach at UVA for the past 11 years, and I involve graduate students in aspects of those projects, not in all of them. The rumor is that grad students do all the work. That's not, we actually have real professionals in addition to grad students, but um, it's another way to try to teach these young planners and landscape architects these principles before they graduate so that they can go out in the world and do this work as well. Thanks to our funders. You always ask me, where do you get all this money? It's not a lot, but these are the current funders. They change uh, year to year. So green infrastructure principles. What am I talking about? Green infrastructure? Well, everyone knows what gray infrastructure is, right? Roads, power lines, pipelines, bridges, all the stuff we need for civil society. Green infrastructure is the other side of that coin. That's the, the tree canopy, the rivers, the things that are also part of what makes life possible, right? We need clean water, we need clean air to breathe, and these natural resources are often overlooked or not included or thought of at the last minute. So what we're really trying to do is to get planners to include this as they plan, or even better, before they even start master planning. So this is an example from Washington, D.C. And on your left, you'll see the road network and a little blue infrastructure with the Anacostia River. But when we're talking green infrastructure, we're looking at the tree canopy part, the lungs of the city thing that makes Washington, D.C. even barely tolerable. Okay? And I grew up there, so I can say that. It's very hot there. But we have this wonderful, one of the largest urban parks in the world, Rock Creek Park. We have a lot of big old trees. It's an old city. But we also have to plan to conserve those. And D.C.'s had a lot of problems with storms in the, the recent uh, couple of decades because they haven't been keeping up with the replanting needs. So really try Casey Trees now is a group that's working on that. There's a lot of neat uh, organizations trying to make sure that we think about this. But the point is to think about it before you start. Key principles, supporting native species, maintaining natural ecological processes, sustaining air and water, and really important, contributing to the health and quality of life for people. Okay, so really trying to make sure that we do not forget that we live in this environment. So when people tell me, you know, I'm an environmentalist or I'm not an environmentalist, I really don't get into labels too much. I just say, who breathes? <laughs> who drinks? Water. Okay. Well, the water came from somewhere. If you're visiting one of our fine brew pubs on the Brew Ridge Trail here, it still came from somewhere. And we need that stuff to be clean. So you don't have to be a bunny hug to care about this. It's also about connections. So that's a, another part of the principle that we're trying to promote is not just thinking about a park over here or a forest or reserve over there, but how <clears throat> these landscapes connect, right? We don't want to create biological islands or deserts that are isolated. So trying to think about making these connections and making sure that we intentionally plan to leave them open. So the corridors, 
generally about 300 meters wide, ideally, to connect large, intact patches of habitat. There's a lot of key species in Virginia that need to be protected. And so that's a real concern to try to identify where those are and try to preserve those areas. But I like what someone from the Fish and Game Department told me, which is, I want to protect really common species. Because it's really hard to bring them back once they're already threatened or endangered. Like, I want my job to be easy. I want to keep all the common stuff common. Okay? So it's not just about the rare stuff, but also just having enough habitat for all these critters. Why now? Well, uh, we don't really get into the issue of population growth. I really don't talk about that. What we talk about is the patterns in which we're consuming our land. So over a 12-year period in the South, the population grew 22%, but they ate 60% of the land. And that's because we have wider roads, we're developing out in the countryside, everybody wants the food lion or the Kroger's out there, now they want dry cleaners, they want daycare. Pretty soon, you know, you have a typical sprawl. So the pattern in which we're using our land is much bigger of a footprint than it used to be. And that's why it's a real concern. So everyone's probably heard of smart growth, right? Where to put stuff? Put your stuff close to your existing sewer line, your existing road, build around the town where you already have a school and the one traffic light or whatever you have there. Um, but that's not really going to get the job done. This is the typical plan in Virginia. Take your county, put a diagonal line through it, save half, sacrifice the other half. Planner takes a long lunch break. <laughs> easy planning, easy peasy. You can't draw a diagonal line here. You can do the horizontal one. Okay, but that again does not conserve our best resources. And I just uh, actually had a conversation with the county, I won't name, uh, that did this kind of a plan here in Virginia. And they said, well, we also want a good map of our best agricultural soils. And I said, okay, here they are. Here's your brown infrastructure, if you will. And they said, oh, no, no, we don't like this map because we already put all our subdivisions on top of those. And we made our conservation zone the bad soil for agriculture. I said, well, I'm really sorry you did that. And they said, well, don't show anyone this map. <laughs> it's your data. You can do it. It's data. You know, it is what it is. I can't fix it now. I can't move the dirt. So thinking about where are all those assets, right? Where are your wetlands? that you need to help recharge. Where are your reservoirs? Where are your farm soils? Where do people live? Where are all these assets? Put them all together on the same map, then think about what makes sense to make a growth area, your development area, or what you want to conserve and why. So that you can be gray and green, <coughs> and smart and green. Okay? You don't have to be either or, right? <laughs> you can be smart greenies. Okay, clustering is something that's Fairly popular notion, uh, popularized a lot by Randall Aaron, the idea of putting your houses closer together so that you can conserve some green space. Um, you see a lot of these cluster developments though plopped out in the middle of rural areas. So you have to think about, you know, what is that imprint? And a lot of folks, when they put their green space on their plan, they don't look at what's going on next door. And I've been a chair of a planning commission, and I know that when the site plans come in, they're like an island floating in outer space. You have a drawing of a parcel, and there's nothing, it's just on white paper. There's nothing around it. You don't think about that, you just look at the site plan. So really trying to say, what is the bigger picture here? By laying these out in advance, then you can start to ask those smart questions like, uh, should that parcel on the left be a purchase and development right, an easement? Should the middle area maybe be developed at sort of a moderate density? Maybe your highest density is over there, we have less resources. It's not rocket science. Ian McCard came up with a lot of these ideas in 1969, when I was five years old. But it's not being practiced today as the norm, and that's what we're trying to get it to be. So some of the benefits, I think I'm preaching to the choir, so I won't go through all of these. But the notion that we need to have good quality of life, healthy water, good biodiversity, bigger issues, stormwater management. I work a lot with communities on the coast. They just want to not die during the next storm. And these are very basic needs. So by thinking about where storm surge occurs, where sea level rise is happening, you can start to get at this. Now this is my only math slide. I know it is after lunch. Oh, just uh, bear with me. How we know an area is interior forest is we want to find about 100 acres. That, according to the literature, will give us a really pretty good diversity of species. Now bigger is better. A couple thousand acres is wonderful. We have a lot of that in Nelson County but at least 100 acres, and then we subtract out that area that's edge. 
where invasives can get in and cause trouble. And this is where the math comes in. The way we know how wide that edge is is we take the average height of a tree, which in Virginia is about 100 feet, and we multiply times three, and that is uh, 300. <laughs> ah, somebody got it for it before you, sir. Okay, so um, yeah, I know we can now we can figure this out. So we take out that, that 300 foot area and subtract that. That is no longer considered part of the interior because there are species that prefer the interior. So even though um, the bear will go visit the Walmart trash can on occasion, in general, they really do like to have interior. And then there are ones that cause trouble at the edges. Brown-headed cowbird up on the right likes edge. How many of you are familiar with that critter? Okay, a fair number of you. It basically lays its eggs in other words and as they hatch sooner, they outcompete. Okay, so it's like you take your children to your neighbors and you leave them. They raise them. You're like, good job, now send them to college. It, it doesn't work for you. But for the cowbird, it works really well. And so as a result, that's the number one nesting species right here where you are. So we are in the brown-headed cowbird sanctuary at this moment. Because why? We've got a whole lot of edge up here. Okay? Now the Wintergreen Nature Foundation has done a fantastic job at getting a whole a lot of land set aside in permanent easement so that we won't have the whole area be like that. But we have to think about our, our footprint and where we're putting our homes. An uh, invasive species can get in, and then the domestic cat. And in full disclosure, that's my cat. She can't catch anything. So actually, all wildlife is safe. But um, normal cats could. Now, uh, what we're also concerned about is when these patches become disconnected. And um, I don't know how to use the pointer. And I'm not going to use it because I'll probably turn the whole thing off. I'll just use my finger. If you look up there on the left side, you'll see if we remove that little circle in the middle where the X is, those critters or plants or pollinators cannot move across the landscape over time. If something happens like disease or blow down or something to those animals, they can't repopulate. And so you have extirpation in that zone, possibly extinction. So trying to make sure that these connections exist is a key environmental principle. All right, that was all the landscape ecology for today. I teach this at UVA for a whole semester, so uh, we got off easy. Uh, but these are the basic planning steps, and it's really just common sense. Asset mapping, what do you have? Okay, and you have to sit down and think through what do we think an asset is. Is it our groundwater recharge zone for drinking water? Is it uh, ag soils for farming? What is the thing that you want to care about? <laughs> what's at risk? Not just what you have, but what's going away. All right, so what is your zoning calling that? The future industrial area? Are you like that county that put all your subdivisions on top of the good stuff? Right? What's at risk? Then what are you what are you gonna do about it? Something might be at risk of going away and use the community say, but we really want the Walmart there. So we're gonna give that up. But what are you gonna save to make up for that? Right. And then policy implementation. So actually putting this these maps into your comprehensive plans, changing your zoning if it's inappropriate, adding additional conservation measures, doing more education for all the people who already built their home in the fire zone. Okay, getting that forester out to work with them. There's a woman in Nelson County, by the way, uh, who the forester worked with. I hope she's not in this room because I don't really know who she was. Uh, but she told her what to do because she built her house in the woods in a high fire risk area. And so she told her the things to do to protect her house in case a fire would come. And then the woman had her back six or nine months later and said, well, what do you think? And she said, you didn't do anything I said. And she said, well, what do you mean? She said, get your keys, your photos, and your kids and get the hell out. That's your, that's your fire plan. All right, figure it out, put them in the car now. So it's really important to not just think about this in terms of conservation, but also public safety. All right, natural landscape assessment. I'm going to show you a state model. How many of you guys have already seen this model? A couple of you are pretty familiar, yeah. Um, some of you are with the state. But basically, Virginia does an outstanding job of modeling things. So we have some really great folks um, in Richmond. Sit, get leery eyed in their dark closets, making these models for us. Um, and we don't always know they exist. So everything I'm going to show you is stuff you can get from the Division of Natural Heritage. Okay? And they'll give it to you for free. Um, but what they've done is they've actually mapped the largest intact habitats in Virginia. And you'll see, of course, the red, and this is a little backwards, but red is good in this model. We always think green is good, but in this model, red is good. Don't ask me why, I have no idea. But red's good, and so you see the large intact areas along the Blue Ridge. We have National Park, National Forest. You see the Great Dismal Swamp, right? Down there in the corner by 
side of the southeast. So these are ranked, orange is the next best, yellow is pretty good, and then there's sort of moderate in general. And these are all ranked against uh, what's possible for Virginia. So these cores are compared statewide. This is what the ranking entails, roughly. Uh, are they in the wildlife plan on tier one, providing essential habitats? Um, how big are they? Uh, how far is it to the interior? How protected would the species be? Do they have a threatened or endangered species? And the core isolation index is a little odd. That means how far away is it from you? And why would it get points for being away from you guys? Wow. You're bothering these things, yeah. We're, we're tracking in invasives, we're making edge, we're doing things. So apparently, according to this model, if it's far from you, it gets more points. Okay. Not that Betsy herself would do anything, but you know. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a little bit about what we did in Nelson County. So the first phase, graduate students uh, worked with me to research some of the issues. Um, and we actually updated the model. So we added in all the new developments that had happened in the last decade and actually hand digitized out those areas that were no longer ecologically intact. Um, we did a lot of interviews with community members. We held a public forum um, in Nelson County for everyone to come along and look at stuff, including the board of supervisors. Um, and then uh, we basically did a number of other presentations. I was here at Earth Day doing a similar presentation to this. We presented to the Planning Commission, the Board of Supervisors, etc. So these reports are now out in the community and the county is about to update its comprehensive plan. So we are hoping, crossing our fingers, that these maps will make it all the way through into the comp plan. There's a series of themes, and why we just do themes is to help, if you're interested in forests, you might want to look at that map. If you're really interested in water issues, you might look at that map. So we try to divide them up by different uses. This is all GIS digitized information, so you can turn on and off layers and make another theme if you want to. Uh, but this is just to help with the planning. So Nelson County is pretty spectacular in that it's more than two-thirds forested. And that's pretty good for a county to be that heavily forested. But it's also special because it has some of the best quality habitats in the state. And part of that has to do with the fact that we have the National Park and National Court. We have enough you know, federal land that it remains intact. But we also just have very large blocks of forested land here. So there's 311,000 some plus acres of intact cores. Okay, that's the total acreage of interior habitat. 250,000 roughly those are outstanding. Okay, so comparing that to statewide level, this is pretty unique. And the example, I just picked that, that whole red area because it's all contiguous, it's considered one core. 20,000 acres, 14 element occurrences of rare threatened or endangered species, and 5,000 of those acres are considered to be contributing to drinking water recharge. That's just some of the data, but you can actually take a little tool, a little eye tool, and click on any of those cores and see the kind of things that are going on in there and then use that to help prioritize what do we want to do. Now, if we were to just give a map like this to the county and say, here, look at all the nice colors. Now save it. That uh, is saving everything, which isn't necessarily viable. So we tend to pick the top, the most highest priority to show them, to give them some sense of what, if you're gonna save anything, save these. Now we look at other issues, like are people drinking water from there? Is there a drinking water intake? What else is going on in that area that might make it special? So, we put in all the E911 address points, which are the, the dots, the black dots on that. Um, and then we erased areas that had already been impacted. They're no longer ecologically intact. Um, so we provided that to the county. And then also, this, this map is showing of all those different colors. We just basically blended them all into one color to make it a little easier to read. And then looked at what are the key connecting corridors across the county. So going across from uh, east to west, north to south, diagonally, sort of up there at the top. We're trying to help the county start to think about these as a connected landscape. So Nelson thinks of itself sometimes as 29 south, 151, as, as the, that's the area. But they, there's really good forest cover across some of those, and those still, animals can still go across those forests, especially through streams. Of course, even with all this forest cover, Nelson County still has some problems. And 
I live down at the bottom. I live at the mouth of the Rockfish River myself. And boy, has it been roiling with mud, and it's like chocolate milk coming down. And it's, it's full of all the sediment that comes off these kind of land uses, right? With no stream buffer, cattle in the creek. Some of that will probably change because of the Chesapeake Bay implementation. Um, but even their old problems like the uh, purple, which is E. coli, PCB, and mercury in fish tissue in the James River at the southern border. That, you know, that, those PCBs, that's an old pollution problem. So that's leaking from some transformers for, you know, from old problems. And that's what's going on today, but it's still impaired. So what we try to talk to counties about is if you're concerned about the cost and the effort that you're having to put into cleaning up these TMDLs, total maximum daily load plans that the DQ and EPA makers do, how about protecting some of these areas? You know, that's not the next TMDL in the future, right? Instead of, you know, it's backwards to try to be cleaning it up. It takes a lot of effort. It's expensive, and it doesn't always work. Also, look at where the agricultural soils are. You can see that uh, in Nelson County, the sort of prime soils are the dark brown. And there's not a whole lot of that here. Okay, this county actually is going to be better for grazing and for orchards. They have steep slopes, so we looked at steep slopes. Slopes are great for growing fruit. All right, so all the wonderful wineries we have here, the orchards, those slopes become an asset, and those wineries, uh, the grapes like crappy soil. Okay, so what in another county would be a detriment for Nelson County is an asset because they really uh, have a long tradition of fruit growing. So trying to help them think about that, and then we looked at parcel size, and in our policy guide, make some recommendations on areas that maybe should be set aside for agriculture. Uh, considering uh, down zoning, uh, creating some larger blocks of land uh, in some parts of the county, and implementing their conservation zone. They have very little of that in the county, they should have a lot more. Also, really important to try to link these natural resources to recreation and other amenities. So, my favorite thing here is the Brew Ridge Trail. I've never been on it, of course. But it's uh, a neat thing, it's kind of cute, you know, the Blue Ridge Trail, the Brew Ridge Trail. Uh, and they have got the wineries linked up with the breweries. And uh, what I try to talk to them about is the fact that the water is super important to these industries. So this is Taylor Smack, owner of Blue Ridge Mountain Brewery, testifying at the Board of Supervisor meeting. Why he wants to expand his operation here? Because the water is so good. Why is the water so good? Because the forest cover is so good most of the county, right? And I talked to the county about the fact that why do people from Charlottesville drive here to drink beer? We have beer in Charlottesville, lots of beer, okay? But people still drive all the way out to Nelson County to drink their beer because of what? Because they get to see this beautiful backdrop, all right? That, that's got an economic link, right? So we're trying to help Nelson County make those links between protecting their view sheds, protecting their forest cover, and also fostering more of these kind of industries, and also attract people who drive out to microbrew pubs, let's face it, folks, that tend to have a little more money to spend than the average bear, okay? So uh, trying to bring these industries together, and then also showing them where their orchards are, the farmer's markets, trying to make sure that all these are together. And then we've given all this data to the county, because they didn't have this in their databases. So when they would do a plan, they wouldn't say, oh my, but that's part of the Brewery Trail. We should be careful about that zone. So trying to make sure that this kind of data is in their GIS, that that's part of the planning that they do. Right, so how do you market this to decision makers? Uh, whether you're in Nelson County or whether you're just back uh, where you live, grabbing some of this information, there's green infrastructure plans across Virginia. So what are we if I'm in an urban area and I want to convince them to care about their trees, an example from New York City, and they look, use infrared um, imagery to figure out what made the city the coolest. As in, not cool like funky, but cool, comfortable, okay? Temperatures, tree trees. Number one thing that cools New York City. So if you want to cool that city down and make more bearable street trees, then green roofs, then light board services, and last open space planning. So it, it helps to have this kind of information to show some real data when you're trying to people also, tree canopy has real value. It's important for reducing heat. Some of the counties are a cool county. They've signed that initiative. They've signed uh, the mayor's climate change in initiative. A lot of uh, cities in Virginia have signed that. So you remind them, if you want to make your city cooler, 
Look at your trees. Do a tree inventory. Uh, trees also provide more attractive areas for development in historic districts and opportunities for people to interact. The University of Washington did a study and found that people shop longer and more often and spend 12% more money when there's a tree. Trees, just open your wallet, okay? But it's, it's nicer there. They like it, okay? So cities have been going back in and putting in trees, and even on a narrow old historic street, you can just bump it out and create a tree well. It is doable. There are smaller canopy trees. You can put even a very crowded district, but you will start to reap the rewards. And that's, of course, Charlottesville Downtown Mall. You've probably been there. They thought the planners were crazy when they closed the street and planted trees in the middle. Now it's like the number one successful pedestrian mall in America. Uh, this is my um, trees will make you healthy, right? So you can get out. It's also been an interesting uh, recent study on people who have um, attention deficit disorder. It was a, a double blind study and they took uh, one set was getting their meds and the other set was getting 20 minutes a day exposure to green trees, right? They had the same results. In other words, take kids off the meds, put them out in the forest. Their attention spans will actually improve markedly. Clean air, right? Just removing vault organic compounds out of the air. Also, a lot of concern in urban areas with asthma. So, trying to look at, at trees, not just how many times you get kids to the hospital. Uh, mental health. People heal faster. So, for example, there's a hospital going in Accomack County right now. We're trying to work with those guys to show them that it's really important to green around the hospital and to create these nature experiences because they'll be able to turn their beds over faster and that means more money for them. So you can really make these economic arguments. Let's crowd your trees. I don't know why. Policemen say, I don't want to put trees up. Crack dealers hide behind them and do drug deals. But the truth is, there's actually less crime your trees. I don't know if it makes you nicer. I don't know why, but people don't do that. Uh, it, also, it also raises your IQ. To say if you've been hitting your spouse, feeling dumb, go on the tree instead. Okay. <laughs> and employees will exercise, don't have to raise your hand or anything. Employees will exercise if they can access green where they work and on the way to work. So there's a lot of great stories that I don't have time to tell today. But by re-greening downtowns, they've brought tens of millions of dollars back to the downtown because businesses want to be there now. Okay, this is my greener structure making the bridge slide. Uh, Savannah River Walk, they invest $8 million and they get $198 million in new investment. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to do that math. National Association of Realtors. I like to use um, citations from places that are not considered right-wing fringe groups. Okay? Left-wing, whatever wing you want. Um, they found that 1% to 2% of home buyers golf, 5 to 6% swim, and more than 50% use pads. So if you're a developer, try to think, what, what, what do I do to sell my development? Put it in the pads. 57% of voters are more likely to purchase a home near green space, and 50% will pay 10% more. And if you start to break this down to the site level, if you're trying to get a developer to leave some green space or leave a green corridor, you can actually start to do the math on, well, you can sell those homes faster and for more money, all the ones that touch the green space, so you will actually not lose any money by taking out some units in your development if that's what you have to do. You'll actually be ahead. Time's money, you're paying down the loan, you want to go ahead and pay that down as quickly as possible. So the developers that are still doing okay in this crazy, horrible housing environment are those that are greener. All right, and then there's just another statistic about you can actually get to the equation with how many feet away you are from the green belt, uh, how much your house is worth. All right, job development, I mentioned that already. So there's just some statistics. Uh, the creative class, artists, media, lawyers, and analysts make up 30% of the workforce, and they place a premium on outdoor recreation and access to nature. So when counties are trying to compete for businesses, they're trying to, you know, they get the little business park that almost never works, put the business in a business park. What they really want is they want to be downtown where the latte is and the nature trail and the bike shop, and they want, that's what they want. Um, so we have to think out of the box a little bit. And then I thank the Sierra Club because I stole this slide from them. Um, but simulations are also another great way to make the case for urban trees. So this is Oakland, California. Now, of course, there's nicer parts of Oakland. I've been there many times, but this is an ugly part. I mean, would you live there? Fantastic. Okay. So, just you know, bring your buildings forward a little bit, densify it. Put the trees in. Okay. And people think this kind of stuff's crazy, but I've seen it done. Right? You can actually retrofit an old street to really create a fun pedestrian environment. <laughs> all of the real estate guys are included there, and all the vendors are making a lot more money. They're in shop. So, I'm going to run through just quickly some different applications. Don't worry about reading all that stuff. I have some examples for these. I'm 
Um, Rancid planning. Not something that really gets people's motors running usually. Not that exciting. Comp planning. What the hell is that? Okay. But we have to do it in Virginia every five years, and we're supposed to be looking at our how many people are living in our community, how are we going to meet growth in the future, where are we going to you know, zone for what. Um, but most comprehensive plans do not include natural resources, or if mentioned, they lack any spatial maps or information. So, uh, for example, when we re rewrote Charlottesville's comprehensive plan, it said, Charlottesville is a pleasant climate, they didn't mean like weather data, they meant it's nice here, and it has some rivers. That's all it said. Oh, and it said geology. And I think they copied some rock formation down from somewhere. But that was it. It was one page. It was just a page of nonsense. It didn't even name the Rybanda River. <laughs> so it was easy to fix that. <laughs> Step one, put in some good information about what resources they have. Step two, some spatial maps. Step three, some actual goals and recommendations on what to do. And bless their hearts, they did most of them. All right, they actually did them. Um, so trying to make sure that just oh, go back and open your comp plans from wherever you're from if you haven't already done that or not, haven't worked on it, and just see what does it say. Uh, because when you have new zoning come forward, and when somebody wants to change their zoning, they have to go back and see what the comp plan said. Right? So I'm working with a developer in Richmond right now who's trying to get a rezoning to do less dense development. When we go to the city's master plan, it says we would like to have houses closer together to conserve our natural resources. Bingo. We have the legal foundation for asking for the change to have more open space in the development. He's already got a permit to do the whole thing by right and build the whole thing out. He doesn't want to do that anymore because he became green. Okay, park and open space planning. Just trying to figure out if you're going to be uh, putting in parks, could you also grab your green infrastructure as part of that? Can you target where those future parks are to also do double duty by preserving some key species? Add forestal districts. Some counties love them and have tons of them. Some have none. Some have just one. Uh, but the idea is perhaps uh, Nelson County can consider expanding their ad forestal districts. They're not permanent. They're incentive-based. But it does at least establish that we're going to try to maintain this area for agriculture. And that's super important because you don't want to be the last farm surrounded by subdivisions. Because now you can't buy feed. Everyone's whining about your tractor. Pretty soon you get sick of it and go to Florida. This is a picture from up here on Wintergreen. If you drive around, you'll probably see that view. Um, so thinking about uh, purchase of development rights, what lands are really important? Do you want to think about actually purchasing those rights, giving that landowner compensation for not developing so they still have some retirement? Uh, Nelson County does have a PR program. They just don't have any money in it. Maybe that's a, a question of saying to, or, so there are some rich people around this uh, region. Some of you may know some. You may be one. Um, <laughs> I'll take your money right now. The, the key is to have a strategy. When you go to talk to the rich people, they want to know, they're business people, they want to know what's the strategy. How do you know that this is the land to purchase those rights from? So smart communities have started to incorporate these maps in their PDR programs so they can show that strategy. And they've been successful at increasing revenue that way. Transfer development rights not used that much in the Commonwealth yet. It's a new tool. Um, we just got the authority to actually use it. The basic idea is you have some development rights that Farmer Brown has over here from some plat filed in 1952. You want to build closer to town. He needs retirement. All right, maybe you can transfer those rights over here. Have a broker who handles the transfer. The reason it hasn't been really too successful yet is the receiving zone where you send those rights to needs to be ready to receive those, those developments. They need to have enough school. They need to have the water and sewer. They need to be ready for that. So you have to prepare. And the other problem is what you find if you're the county that wants to do the whole TDR thing, and the county next to you is like, woohoo, developers, do whatever you want here. We have no rules. Come to our county. It's really hard to compete. And so you almost need to do this on a regional scale with multiple counties to make it work. So that is my opinion and the opinion of the person at the state who's kind of in charge of this program. So <laughs> basically, it's an idea. It, it could work eventually, but it, it just it needs a lot more um, massing of counties cooperating to make it work. And then, um, Zoning or overlays, you may upzone, you might increase density somewhere, you may downzone, uh, less dense lots. Historic districts, trying to look at where those historic structures are clustered and think about does that warrant becoming a district. And also watershed protection, restricting development around reservoirs. So all uh, the counties have their
their future water supply plan, how many of them really looked at the land cover to see whether in the future that water quality would still be good. Charlottesville spends a lot of money to treat the water in its uh, reservoir because a uh, ton of development has already occurred upstream of that. It's a huge watershed, the reservoir's at the end, and it's gross. Okay, so that's not a technical term, by the way. All right, tour of the planning. Really important in Nelson County. This might be less important depending on where you are, but here, these resources, the story of what happened with Hurricane Camille and the people who lost their lives, these are all tied to natural resources. Uh, plantation homes, visitor centers, the setting and the context around them is really important. And you've got a better models for development guide floating around in the room. I saw it earlier from Valley Conservation Council. John's got it there. So that really talks about this importance of juxtaposition. You know, what's next to what really matters. And so tourists are not only not, only not going to visit something if it's next to something ugly, but the route they take to get there is really important. So counties always ask me, uh, why did the cell tower company put the cell tower in, on the most iconic view? We love that red barn view. We love, you know, that's our favorite. Well, how do they know what your favorite view is? They just drove up from North Carolina. And a guy GPS did and said this would be a good spot. All right, they don't know if you don't write it down and tell them. So that's uh, something really important and also something for Nelson to spend maybe some more time is to to map those out. So view shed protection. Where is the visual character most important to the community? Yeah, that's the, uh, the farm of a well-known citizen. Uh, private sector, there's a lot that can be done. Land air conservation easements, got a lot of great experts here with uh, land trusts. The Gene Outdoors Foundation is here, Valley Conservation Council is here, others are here that take easements. Um, it doesn't work for everyone, so it's just one tool. And you want to be strategic in where you spend your time. But a number of land trusts that we work with are now using green infrastructure maps to target where they work. Instead of just taking any easement, they're saying, I'm going to go after consecutive, uh, uh, what am I trying to say, things that are next to each other. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I need help with vocabulary today. Yeah, contiguous land parcels to try to get a larger area protected. Or if there is protected, they are targeting the land next to it as to act as a buffer to mitigate the impacts of the development that's nearby. Croppers. Uh, not all counties have a proper program. Developers call them bribes, but essentially you give the county something to offset the impact of your development when you're asking for a change in the zone. Now, counties often say, why didn't the developer proffer the park we want? Or why, you know, because they have no idea what you want. So you write it down, you put it on your website, you're not allowed to ask for proffers, but if you publish it in a place where anyone can see it, this is what we'd like to have then it's much more easy to get those. But to quote a past president of the Home Builders Association, please just tell me what you want and I'll do it. I just want you to tell me. Okay. And he, he, anyway, I won't say more about him, but he actually set aside a lot of land. Creative land planning. Just things like avoiding unnecessary land clearing. Uh, providing links to trails. Having your master trail plan on a map so that when a developer comes along, they know exactly where you want them to plug in. We've had great success with this in Charlottesville. Developers build the trail right down and create a connected network. It doesn't cost the city anything. It simply requires that you have a master map to show them again, tell them what you want. All right, so these are just a couple of discussion questions. So I didn't want to just talk at you all day and then run away. I thought maybe we'd take a couple minutes to just hear maybe from you guys on how uh, you guys are working on these issues or other things that maybe I didn't cover that your organization is doing. So I just want to open it up. If I put you in a coma. Um, yes. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, is, there, is there any chance or word for the stand? Is it uh, possible that the state is the comprehensive plan because they, they state things that must be in the plan? Kind of thing. Right. Did, would, could they mandate that green infrastructure would be part of any comprehensive plan? Yeah, you just hit one of my favorite issues. Um, Yes, it, right now in the state code, if I'd had more time, I would have gone into the detail, but it says, and you may also identify areas for natural resources, parks, what have you, but it's a, it's a may thing. You, know, you may also do this. It would be really wonderful if they had to have something on it. And I don't think that would be a huge burden on any, at least just note that they have these features. They wouldn't necessarily have to hire consultants, but the state has already spent all this money to map a lot of this. 
in models that are free to obtain. And has there been any legislation that refused, or has anybody tried to put a bill together to? Not so far, but I, that's something I would really like to see happen. And I know that um, you know one of the keys is to have some good examples of where counties have put this in their comp plans. And so I think enough times go by, we do have some great counties. Virginia Beach is another one that's done a pretty good job of really putting that in their comprehensive plan. There was a study done of uh, all the Chesapeake Bay localities and how many even mentioned for us, and what did they say, and how well did they actually uh, put in measures or goals that would actually conserve them. So those studies are out there now, and I think that that would provide some good fodder for a policy effort. People always complain when they're made to do something, but uh, sometimes it's actually a really good idea. And <laughs> we just got to try it. Yes, that's it. Um, it was interesting with the cars and with tech and the cars. Uh -huh. You know, with climate change, and hopefully that's way off and, you know, it's going to Right. Nature Conservancy and some other organizations are trying to create cars that as animal and plant move north because of the difference in temperature. Right. They would be able to move. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, so those right. cars are really important, not only for today, but maybe for 300 years from now. Exactly. You're trying to create some resiliency. So, um, an example in Maryland, they're actually already actively acquiring a lot of the land above what's going to be underwater. We're not doing such a good job of that in Virginia. Yeah. We're just starting to recognize that uh, one concern with climate change is that the rate of, of, of water rot see, see, it's been rising for a long time. Yeah. But the rate of sea level rise will be fast enough that those habitats won't catch up. And what will happen is, what, has, what wasn't true 400 years ago, is that, as you say, the animals or plants are actually moving up, and now they're hitting, you know, an industrial use or something. They're yeah. not, there's no room for them to go. Or it's an area that's been diked and drained, and now they, they don't have that option. So there's carbon. They're like safety valves. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So when uh, the State Department of Transportation is doing its road planning, right, knowing that this is a key corridor, maybe that's something you don't want to slice right through the middle, or if you do, you want to provide some additional amenities to try to keep that crossing attack under the road or through other measures. Yeah? Uh, just a very practical question. Sure. When you did this with UVA resources and UVA grants, trying to do is to build capacity so that counties can do this themselves so they don't necessarily have to outlay money. So let me tell you how that's happening. One way is we've been working with a number of the planning districts across Virginia. Um, and so they are covering multiple county areas and they have mapped the key green infrastructure at the regional scale. So when they're doing their regular work to help counties update their comp plan, they've got that data there and can just incorporate that as part of what they do. We're also writing a book on how to do this. Uh, we just got the grant last month, and so we're going to be writing out all the steps for how you do this work. So all the work we've been doing has been field testing so that your GIS folks in your county, uh, with maybe a little bit of help from their PDC if they need it, could actually then do their own plan. So what we've done is to go work out the kinks, figure out the easiest way to do these things. We made the mistakes so you don't have to. Uh, and so I don't think it's necessarily an outlay of cash that's an issue, unless it's a really small county. You know, and then again, maybe they partner with their PDC. So you could spend, if a private consulting firm did this for you, and you wanted lots and lots of themed maps and four public workshops and a steering committee and you know posters and graphics, you know, maybe you're going to spend thirty to fifty thousand um, dollars. But you can also do it yourself. Um, a lot of what we do is coaching counties on how to do this. So right now we are coaching Northern Virginia and how to do this work. Their GIS people are doing it. We're just coaching them for a very small amount of a few thousand dollars. Uh, but they are doing the work, and we like that because then when we're done, they, they did it. So they know how to do it. We're sharing some of our graphics with them because, you know, we, we give those away. Yeah. This sounds like a UN plan force all of us to live in cities and dense areas, given the exactly. landscape away from <laughs> wild animals. What do you say to that? <laughs> yeah. <pick up. laughs> Well, I did receive an award once from the UN, so I, all right there is the smoking <laughs> gun. Um, but 
But um, <laughs> yeah, that I, I tell people, I get, I get that a lot, you know, and what people are most concerned about, this sort of rampant paranoia, that we've had different parts of our country's history, McCarthyism. If you really look at that, this feels like McCarthyism in a way. I've seen uh, some things go down in flames that were voluntary efforts, like cool counties in Albemarle just went away. They just got out of Ickley because software was not invented in Albemarle County. Even though I told them that neither is Microsoft Excel. Well, is that? <laughs> Whatever. So, um, but I think that um, what the way that I spin it back to them is to say, this is your information. It's your data. All right. So. You guys are deciding what you want to do with it. You can decide that this is all unique stuff, and what well, we still don't want to do this. We still want everyone sprawled all over. But we're going to add a corridor here, or some kind of conservation zone. Or we really at least want to protect our future water supply area. So it's, it's all actually empowering the locals. So I personally have not um, been subject to the whole onslaught that I have seen, uh, sort of the pitchfork type public meeting. Um, I also talk about common sense. A lot. I say, do you write blank checks? Can I have a blank check, John? Thank you. Would it, would it be worth it? Anyway, you know, we don't do that. We put mounts on our checks because we we know we're, I'm giving you something for something, right? But if you don't know what anything is worth, then you're just giving away the store. So most communities, even really, I work in mostly arch conservative communities. Most of the communities say, well, yeah, we want to know, and then we want to decide. I also honestly do not use the word the S word any of my materials, sustainability. That word has been, I'm not against sustainability, so don't, someone told me that once. It's just been overused, and if you look at those folks who are organizing on this, there's a national website that tells you how to go and attack your board of supervisors, how to interrupt a public meeting, how to uh, say Ickley is you and plot. It's all there, point by point, and it says look for the word sustainability, and anywhere you find that, start a myth about a UN plot. And so, if they search the website, they will not find me with <laughs> the S word. Um, I did hear that green infrastructure made a naughty list somewhere, but nobody knows what that means, so it's too hard to attack. Yeah. But it, it's a real problem. It's something people should be aware of, because planning's becoming a dirty word. Fred? Um, I, I was reflecting on the, the garden color. To, to sum it up in a nutshell, and then anyone else to jump in, because I'm not, I mean, I know the issue, but I'm not, it's not one I'm working on every day. Um, it's the same problem of a uh, lack of uh, long range thinking. So it's the immediate jobs that we'll get. It's not thinking about what will be the burden to that community 100 or 200 years from now when somebody's still supposed to be monitoring that site. Our country isn't even that old. And yet we are proposing that there are sites that we are going to manage for 500 years. I mean, that's a really hard thing to believe. So they're not thinking about the long term. And they're also probably not thinking about other things they want to market their, their community as. Right? So do you want to be, it's just like people want prisons. We want prisons because we get jobs. But they regret that often later because that is the prison county or the, you know, Lord. All the people who live around Lorton change the name of their address so that it doesn't say Lorton. I forget what it's, but like they don't want any, it's just a real real estate downer just because of the proximity. But they just, politicians aren't thinking long term. They're here for the quick buck a lot of them. Not all of them, of course. Anything else? Yeah. Well, I just wondered if you <clears throat> have an assessment of how well the state is doing, particularly VDOT, at using the sort of heritage data you, you showed. I mean, so something like 29 right. bypass, obviously land use is a county under county purview, but if the state decides to build a major highway, it has tremendous implications. So I just wondered what your assessment is. I, I don't know that I could say great things about VDOT and how well it's progressively using our state models. The, st the models were created at the state level precisely so that the governor could use it to figure out about where they should target land for conservation easements where future parks could go, where future game areas could go, and also presumably for trying to work out highway planning. But most of that highway planning really takes place at the local level. 
that's really where those battles get mostly fought in your, with your metropolitan planning organization and your regional transportation plan. You brought up the, uh, the sort of um, bypass bomb. Uh, that is, irony of that was that the bypass that they want to build around uh, Charlottesville and Albemarle no longer bypasses because it dumps right to the middle of the congested area. So it's really giving you 10 more minutes. Uh, but the key is that the reason that land is there is because some smart folks set it aside to protect the reservoir long ago. And so VDOT says, great, now I can put a highway through here. So that's local politics. And that's why you, know, you have to have folks in your community who are aware of these issues who can come back and fight them. And I think there's going to probably be some changes on the Board of Supervisors during the next election as a result of that.